I just want to introduce Kelly Nee, who is one of the forum organizers uh, and executive director of Ocean Sciences at RPS North America. So welcome, Kelly, and please take it away. Thanks, Jackson. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Climate Adaptation Forum. I'm so excited that we have more than 250 people registered today to learn more about federal funding for climate resilience. Um, undoubtedly, some of you are new to the forum, so I'll give a little bit of background. Um, we're now in our fifth year of climate adaptation forum programming, which is a little bit hard to believe. Um, as Jackson mentioned, we put on quarterly forums on a number of topics related to climate resilience and climate adaptation, everything from finance to retreat, food security, public health, technology. Um, and our annual programming is guided by our steering committee. We have a group of about 15 committed climate professionals who work together to help choose the topics for each year and share the responsibility of chairing each forum. Before we start today's program, I would like to take a moment of remembrance in honor of Lauren Sampson, a member of our steering committee that passed away earlier this year. Um, Lauren was a senior attorney with Lawyers for Civil Rights, uh, and she was nominated to the steering committee because of her tireless work, um, ensuring that the voices of low income, people of color and immigrant communities were part of the climate conversation. Uh, she worked very hard to ensure that the perspectives of disadvantaged communities, their experiences and their needs were part of the solutions. Um, she would have loved today's conversation. From the moment that I met Lauren, I was impressed with her. I really enjoyed our conversations as she got started on the steering committee and I was looking forward to working with her for years to come. She called me about this time last year right after she got started and asked me if she could get involved in the upcoming forum on climate migration. She wanted to shadow the co-chairs. She wanted to learn the ropes of chairing a forum. Um, so I got her involved and engaged. And it was clear from the very first meeting, Lauren didn't need to shadow anyone. Lauren didn't need to learn the ropes. Her passion and her thought leadership shone through immediately in the planning of that forum and throughout the rest of last year. Um, I would like to invite the other two uh, forum organizers, Anne Gisinger and Rebecca Hurst, to share a couple of words about Lauren, too. Thank you, Kelly. I just uh, wanted to say that Lauren was such a bright person, so dedicated, so committed to the forum and to everything that she touched um, through her work in her life her family, friends, and it was a real pleasure to have known her and worked with her. Um, she contributed not only to the forum, but to EBC's environmental justice programming and really helped push EBC to um, explore more environmental justice programming, which is so important. And it was because of her dedication to the topic that you know we were able to move forward and, and plan some programming. It's an incredible loss. I just wanted to say a little few words about her. Um, Rebecca? Yeah, um, Lauren was new to the CAF, uh, so I was only uh, just starting to get to know her when she died. Um, but uh, I was the representative of our core team who got to work with her on the migration forum last year. And I actually, Kelly, I had totally forgotten that uh, she came in under the, um, uh, you know, as a, a shadow, because um, she just brought such energy, creativity, and passion to the group, um, and really, you know, took leadership um, immediately, uh, and just, you know, her sense of humor, um, and her, you know, curiosity, she really made the meeting such a joy, um, and the, just the ripple effects of her loss are huge. I'm really sad that she's no longer with us. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, yeah, Lauren's passing obviously left a huge hole in the climate community, a huge hole in the civil rights community, and a huge hole in the hearts of, of everyone that she touched, which is so, so many people. She'll be missed. Okay, um, to, to start today's forum, I would like to introduce our three co-chairs. Uh, we have Nasser Brahim, Senior Coastal Resiliency Specialist with Woods Hole Group. Nasser will be introducing today's topic. Carolyn Mecklenburg, um, the Greater Boston Regional Coordinator for the MVP program in Massachusetts. 
Carolyn will be moderating our panel on state and local perspectives. And Alex Polly with the, the political director with the Center for Economic Democracy. And Alex will be moderating our federal panel. Before I turn things over to Nasser, um, I would like to thank all of our sponsors and supporters. Sorry, I glossed right over that slide earlier. Thank you, Jackson. Um, we couldn't pull these events off without um, the support and sponsorship of, of all of the organizations on this slide. So thank you very much to everybody that has continued to support the, the forum for these many years. Um, and then I would also like to thank the Jackson Bailey and the EBC staff. Jackson and the EBC staff work tirelessly behind the scenes to make sure that every forum goes off without a hitch, whether it's in person, whether it's virtual, or maybe whether it's hybrid one day. So huge shout out to all of those, all of those folks. And over to you, Nasser. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I will be introducing our program today. Um, so trillions, billions, hundreds, and tens of millions. This is the scale of um, the federal investments included in the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IAJA. Well, that's not a very good um, acronym to say, but. Um, so these laws were passed by the Democratic-led House and Senate and signed by President Biden last year. Um, but there are 50 states in the country and each with hundreds of municipalities. So what do those big dollars mean for the communities we live in and serve? And how can local communities and their partners, particularly those that have been historically excluded or oppressed, get their fair share for badly needed investments in social, infrastructural, and environmental resilience? So these are among the questions that Kelly, Alex, Carolyn, and I sought to answer and there's no better group than the speakers we've assembled to help us. Our first group of speakers represent the state, regional, and local perspectives. Um, Kasha Hart of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council will explain how Massachusetts communities can access ARPA funds for resilience investments. Brendan Sweeney, the state's assistant director of federal funds will explain the same for, um, excuse me, switch that. <laughs> Kasha will be speaking about the infrastructure and Jobs Act, and Brendan will be speaking about the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, Mayor Gary Christensen will share the city of Malden's experience as an environmental justice community working to capitalize on these opportunities for improving climate and social resilience. And our second group of speakers will take us to the federal level and help us center us on environmental justice. Samantha Medlock, the senior counsel for the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, will speak to what the Democratic-led Congress has done so far to support community resilience to climate change and what more it hopes to accomplish. Crystal Lehman, Deputy Director for Climate Resilience at the White House will share the Biden administration's plans, programs and policies for implementing the laws and doing so justly. Justin Schott from the University of Mich Michigan will offer a critical evaluation and suggestions for improving um, the benefits of federal investments for environmental justice communities. And Elizabeth Jean-Pierre, the Executive Director of UPROSE, Brooklyn's finest, grassroots climate justice and resiliency organization will share her experience with resiliency funding post Sandy and how organizations like hers can be best served and engage in this new wave of funding. So thank you all for joining us and I'll pass it off to Carolyn. Thank you so much, Nasser. As Nasser very helpfully and wonderfully introduced, our first panel is going to be on access to federal funding for community resilience. So we're taking a a smaller scale look at the local and state scales on how, how this money is, is being handled and will be used um, for resilience projects. So I would like to introduce our first speaker, Kasha Hart from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Wonderful, thank you so much, Carolyn, and a big thank you to the Environmental Business Council and UMass Boston um, Sustainable Solutions Lab for hosting this forum. Very excited to be here today. Also very excited to share the virtual stage with Brendan Sweeney and Mayor Christensen. So let me go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Um, so again, my name is Kasha Hart and I am a policy analyst with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. For folks who may not be familiar, MAPC is the regional planning agency that serves the 101 cities and towns of Metro Boston, home to 3.4 million residents. Um, our mission is really to promote smart growth and regional collaboration. That's really integral to all of our policy and advocacy work that I'm a part of, but also more of our bread and butter planning work. So master plans, housing production plans, climate action plans, border studies, all of that. 
Um, we are also guided by our re recently adopted regional plan, Metro Common 2050. There is a whole chapter in there focused on climate resiliency. Just, you know, want to make a plug for that if folks haven't seen that yet. So today I want to talk a little bit about IIJA or the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and share a little bit more about, you know, how the dollars get from DC to Massachusetts cities and towns and, you know, what we can do to understand how some of these funds can support climate resiliency projects in communities and across the region. So just a little bit of background in terms of what exactly is in this very sizable law. Um, so IIJA is a $1.2 trillion five-year law that includes reauthorization of surface transportation and drinking and wastewater legislation, as well as some new money for transportation, clean energy, broadband infrastructure, climate resiliency infrastructure, and even more than that. So the actual amount of new funding available is closer to about $550 billion. There's pretty much two ways in which communities and states can access funding, and that is through either new and existing formula programs or competitive grant programs. And I'll explain those two avenues in a little bit more detail. So for others who are like me and our visual learners, I just wanted to break down the funding in IIJA in a little bit more detail. So setting aside the, the existing you know, reauthorizations that's included in IIJA, there's about $550 billion in new investments. You'll see here about 50% or so is going to the transportation sector. But then there's also investments in water, broadband, climate resiliency, and more. And I will say climate resiliency is a theme that does you know, intersect many of these se sectors, transportation very much included. So just to unpack what's included in that pretty large transportation bucket. Um, so the most or the largest proportion of funds is going to road, roads and bridges. There's also you know, a sizable amount of funding going to rail transit and there's some new EV programs as well that I know we're really excited about. So what does this mean for Massachusetts? So on the formula funding side, so there's some new and existing formula programs that are seeing an increase in funds as a result of IIJA. The White House has put forward estimates in terms of how Massachusetts will fare over various programs. And so not surprisingly, based on, on the charts that I just shared, a lot of that money you know, is going to highways and bridges. There's a fair amount of funds also going to public transit. Um, one program that I do just want to call um, your attention to is the transportation resiliency improvements. There is a new PROTECT um, formula program. It's um, a program designed really to enhance the resiliency of the transportation sector. What that means is pretty flexible. The PROTECT program is both a formula program and a, a grant program. So it's one of the few, few examples of IIJA funds where funds are coming down through these established, the established formulas as well as competitive grants. So most of the new IIJA funds that are coming down are going to be through new and existing competitive grant programs. Um, and so this is where, you know, I would really encourage folks to think about what projects you want to elevate, um, because that's really where the opportunity is to secure new funding through IIJA. So I just want to say a little bit more about the role of MPOs in, in this process. I know sometimes the, the role of metropolitan planning organizations can be a little bit um, challenging to navigate. So with respect to you know, resiliency as it relates to the transportation sector, um, MPOs are federally designated entities that carry out transportation planning for a specific metropolitan area. So there's 10 MPOs in Massachusetts, as well as three rural transportation organizations that all function pretty similarly. All federal transportation funding is programmed by MPOs for specific projects, and this includes formula funds and competitive grants. Um, so MassDOT and the T and RTAs will identify the majority of projects for funding, but then cities and towns also compete for funding within their MPO. So as, you know, as I mentioned, these formula funds available in IIJA are going to continue to be programmed through this established process with the MPOs. 
And it's the discretionary grant programs where there is really opportunity to leverage new funds to advance good projects. Those notices of funding opportunity are going to be rolled out on an ongoing basis. And I think, you know, if I leave this group really with anything today, um, it's that now is the time to be elevating good project ideas. And as a planning agency, you know, it's really important to us that we're using this opportunity to move plans in, into implementation. Um, you know, for example, the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program that, that Carolyn runs, um, that's, a, that's a great example of how we can look to some of the existing work that we've already done and leverage IIJA to, you know, make those plans actionable and move into making those, those climate resiliency investments. So in terms of other resources that are available to kind of help unpack what exactly is in the infrastructure bill, I really highly recommend this, this first resource, um, whitehouse.gov backslash build. There, you can go ahead and search for funding opportunities really across all of these sectors that are included in IIJA. You know, if you're really interested in advancing a culvert project with IIJA funds, you can go ahead and type in cul culverts and it'll show you what are the different formula and grant programs, you know, associated with that kind of investment. What's the funding amount available? Um, you know, approximate timeline for when those funds may, may be available. So definitely encourage folks to, to check out that website. Each of the federal agencies have also included um, their own specific uh, infrastructure bill pages. So if there is, you know, a specific grant program that you're interested in, I highly recommend checking that out. And then, you know, we're also trying to compile different resources as it relates to estimated formula funds that Massachusetts is expected to get as well as you know, some of the resources included here on our website. So just you know, wanna make sure folks know that that is a resource. Um, please also look to your regional planning agencies as a resource too, if, if you're looking to sort of surface what projects you think you might be interested in um, elevating with IIJA funds. So with that, I think I'm gonna turn things back over to Caroline. Thanks, Kasha. We uh, ended up a few minutes early for your presentation. So I just wanted to squeeze in one question for you um, that we have in the chat. Um, would you, can you say a little bit more about what it would mean to elevate a good project? Are you talking about like prioritizing with project teams or, or planning, uh, you know, planning projects? Can you just say a little bit more about that before we move on to Brendan? Yeah, so you know it depends if you're looking on working on a transportation related project. That is where you want to go go to your MPOs um, and, and work with your MPO representatives on um, you know identifying a project that's a priority for, for your community or you know your, your subregion. And so if it's not necessarily a transportation related project, but you know a more general climate resiliency project that would be a better fit for a discretionary grant program. Um, again, I think that's working with your local municipality, your regional planning agency to you know, make sure you're ready for when that notice of funding opportunity becomes available. You're most likely, you know, the, the entities that are eligible to apply through these, these NOFOs are local state governments, counties, um, you know, different kinds of units of government. So I think just you know, making sure that those projects are on the radar of, of the entities that are going to be eligible to apply for funds is an important step as you know, more information about specific discretionary grant programs becomes available. All right, great. Thanks very much. Um, I see a few more questions, but I'll save those for all of our um, uh, panelists at the end. Um, so next, I would like to introduce uh, Brendan Sweeney, who's uh, one of my colleagues at another state agency. He is the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at the Executive Office of Administration and Finance at the Commonwealth. And he will be uh, talking more about ARPA for us today. So I will turn it over to Brendan. Thank you. So we will dive right in. As Carolyn mentioned, I am the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs for the Federal Funds Office within the Executive Office of Administration and Finance. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be talking about the Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, which are the most flexible uh, funding streams that came from the American Rescue Plan Act for state governments and local governments, whether that's counties or municipal governments. Uh, 
Uh, primarily, I'm going to focus on the municipal governments, but I will also mention uh, some relevant uses of the state's coronavirus state fiscal recovery fund that have been deployed uh, within the sphere of climate resiliency. So for a little bit of an overview, uh, ARPA was passed in March of 2021, as most of you are aware, uh, and appropriated $350 billion for direct state and local government aid through the two streams, the state and local fiscal recovery funds. Um, it's a program that's administered at a federal level, which is particularly relevant for municipalities. Uh, recipients of this funding will work directly with Treasury uh, for reporting or any other um, all eligibility um, eligible use guidance documents come directly from the U.S. Treasury. Uh, one of those documents, the interim final rule, was implemented in May of 2021, and that was the first fairly lengthy document that outlined the eligible uses of this funding. Uh, that has since been superseded by the final rule in January 2022, um, especially for those uh, working in municipal government that may be watching. It's worth noting that there are some significant changes. Um, however, although the final rule doesn't take effect until next month, if you are planning projects within the expanded eligible uses in the final rule, uh, you can do so immediately. And essentially, the final rule is, while it doesn't officially take effect until April 1st, that's going to be the standard that Treasury uses when determining whether or not a project is eligible. Um, so, I will first dive right in here to talk about, uh, there's a, I'm gonna make sure I didn't miss a slide. Sorry, I did have another slide um, that doesn't seem to be in here, but just to summarize. So the state received roughly um, four and a half billion dollars worth of funding from the Coronavirus State Fiscal Recovery Fund and municipalities have received three and a half billion dollars. And that's been split between metropolitan cities who are the largest cities, um, generally over 50,000 people. Uh, they are CB CDBG entitlement communities. That's the indicator that the federal government used. They are receiving the bulk of that three and a half billion dollars uh, that's flowing through treasury to municipalities. Um, the remaining municipalities, generally those less than 50,000 people, are considered to be non-entitlement units of government. Um, they are receiving less funding, but still a pretty sizable amount for most municipalities directly from Treasury. And then the other determinant that's really worth noting is whether or not you're in a functional or non-functional county. Um, for municipalities that are in non-functional counties like Suffolk County, Essex County, Middlesex County, where they don't provide any services. There are no county commissioners, no formal county government. Uh, the funding that was appropriated for those counties will flow through directly to your municipality. Um, but there is about 300 million or so that is going directly to county governments. So Bristol County, Plymouth County, Barnstable County, some of those in the southeastern part of the state that are still active, uh, they have about 300 million or so worth of coronavirus local fiscal recovery funds that they'll be able to make use out of. Uh, that just identifies the landscape of funding available. Um, so I mentioned the state's four and a half billion. The governor in December of 2021 signed a bill that was uh, appropriated from the legislature. So this funding goes through the typical appropriations process where the legislature will propose a use of the funding and then it goes to the governor. Um, the four billion here is a mix of two and a half billion of that four and a half billion dollar coronavirus state fiscal recovery funds, and then some state money as well, uh, about a billion and a half. Some notable highlights from this bill within the sphere of uh, water and sewer infrastructure, as well as climate resiliency efforts, are a hundred million for water and sewer infrastructure improvements, a hundred million for culverts and dams. Uh, 90 million for marine port development and 25 million for greening gateway cities. I mention this because if you work for a nonprofit or if you're in a municipality, uh, this funding will be run through two um, state secretariats. Carolyn Yeros, the Executive Office of uh, Environmental Affairs, Energy and Environmental Affairs, and then also uh, the Housing and Economic Development. Uh, so definitely take note of this and keep an eye out for these grant programs. Um, but again, 
we're diving into the local fiscal recovery funds for the majority of this presentation. And so, as I mentioned, that final rule outlines four key eligible uses, um, public sector revenue replacement, public health and economic response, premium pay for essential workers. Uh, and finally, what we're gonna really focus on here today, water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. And so specifically, we're gonna focus on water and sewer infrastructure uh, as the guidelines really tailor the eligible uses to using this funding to meet needs on the climate resiliency front through those type of infrastructure uh, improvements. So, as I mentioned, this is a real opportunity to make use of the funding locally uh, to have a local impact on whether or not your infrastructure is climate resilient. And that's really the goal of the funding as Treasury outlines in the guidance. Um, so the general rule of thumb for whether or not an infrastructure project in your community is an eligible use of the funding is whether it's eligible under the EPA's two state revolving fund programs, which are the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. Um, I have lists of project examples, so we'll talk through each, uh, but those that's really the determinant. And uh, there's some links on the end that will help address whether or not a project falls into that eligible category for your community. Um, but additionally, the final rule, as I mentioned, it came out in January, it expanded on what the interim final rule allowed. And so now eligible projects include lead remediation projects, uh, culverts and dams, which is very notable that they were not originally eligible, um, and then other reservoir or local drinking water uh, rehabilitation projects. So there is a pretty wide scope of eligible uses. Um, I've listed examples here. I'm not gonna go through every one of them, but I did wanna kind of generally touch on them. And as you all know, the slides will be made available for those who would like to reference. Um, under the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, um, most notably wastewater treatment plants, we've had a handful of municipalities that have already communicated to us that they are planning to use the funding for regional wastewater treatment plant improvement projects, which is a great use of the funding, something the treasury encourages. Um, on the drinking water state revolving fund, um, notably here, any green infrastructure with regards to your municipal um, drinking water infrastructure is highly encouraged. So I would, as you all know, this is a real opportunity to improve aging drinking water infrastructure in municipalities in a resilient manner. Uh, and then finally, some of the examples that we had touched on, culvert repair, um, dam and reservoir rehabilitation, and then uh, certain lead remediation projects are eligible. So, you know, Kasha mentioned a lot of the available funding under the infrastructure bill. Uh, there is a significant amount of funding within the direct control of municipalities uh, that can work towards those similar type of infrastructure improvements. So uh, definitely I would encourage those in municipalities think about how best to leverage these two different streams of funding um, when you assess the universe of water, sewer infrastructure and transportation infrastructure projects uh, within the lens of becoming a more climate resilient community. So I've left a handful of helpful links here as well as my contact information. I'm happy to assist in any way that I can if you have any specific projects in your community um, or regionally that you may be considering and would definitely encourage you to take a look at some of the materials the Treasury has listed as well as um, further information about how the state has already appropriated uh, some of that $4.5 billion in funding that I had referenced. And with that, I will end the screen sharing and turn it back over to Carolyn. All right, great. Thank you so much, Brendan. That was really helpful. We have a lot of questions coming in through the chat, um, but I'm gonna turn it over to Mayor Christensen first, and then there'll be an opportunity for us to you know, answer all these questions together. Um, so with that, I would love to introduce um, the mayor of the city of Malden, Mayor Gary Christensen who will be talking a little bit about how Malden has been able to use or plans to use uh, some of this great funding. Good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Gary Christensen, mayor of the city of Malden, and I've been mayor now for 10 years. And the question that I have received during the 10 years is, what is your greatest challenge? And prior to this morning's webinar, it would always be one word, resources, never having enough in resources to address 
aging infrastructure, the vulnerability of water resources, climate change, and the list goes on. But now, thanks to all of your efforts, I'm going to have to come up with a new challenge because we have the resources. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be on the call today to say thank you to you all, because I know that you have been advocating over the years to help us to be able to get in a position, especially as an environmental justice community to address a number of these issues. So we were fortunate to work with our state delegation to receive several earmarks that addressed the priorities, not only in the areas of infrastructure, forestry and energy efficiency, but we also were able to obtain earmarks that supported organizations that played vital roles in the community, such as the Bread of Life, the Malden Public Library, Malden Overcoming Addiction, the Immigrant Learning Center, and the YWCA. Now, the key for us has been to maintain a close relationship with our state delegation. So we meet with our representatives, Paul Donato, Steve Altrino, Kate Lipper Garabedian, and State Senator Jason Lewis every three months year round. So it allows us this one hour meeting to discuss the city's priorities, as well as to give them an update on ongoing projects. Uh, we make them aware of any state grants that we're applying for, so their offices can work with us to collaborate on obtaining those grants. Now, as far as prioritizing, uh, we meet with our city departments all the time to figure out which earmarks we should focus on. So for example, our engineering department in conjunction with our Department of Public Works has been working on an aggressive lead line replacement program. And that's because we are currently under a consent order with DEP and working to replace as many lead line per year as possible. Now, the biggest challenge we have found on replacing the lead lines is not so much on the public side, but it's on the private side, since most of the residents can't afford what is an average cost of $3,500 to $5,000 to replace their part of the service. So as a result, in 2022, we're going to be utilizing the federal APA funds as part of a replacement initiative and the plan is to focus on specific streets in areas that serve the most children. We are also working with Congresswoman Catherine Clark to secure federal infrastructure funding in the amount of $3.36 million. When looking at earmarks and grants, in addition to the work in each of our departments, we also try to align our priorities with the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Report. Our Malden River Works project is one such idea. For decades, uh, the river to my, life, my left, your right, uh, was in the industrial backyard of the city and it was polluted and neglected. But through community advocacy, uh, bold creativity and the leveraging of several grants and earmarks that we're discussing today, the river is now poised for a revival. The aim of the Malden River Works project is to transform the Department of Public Works yard on the Malden River for better climate change preparedness and to create a vibrant, resilient public riverfront park. The project will reduce climate vulnerability by introducing nature-based solutions at the DPW that also benefit the park, including green stormwater infrastructure to reduce surface flood risk, increase tree canopy to mitigate the urban heat island effect, and an elevated greenway path to serve as a flood barrier from sea level rise. Partnerships and collaborations, as I mentioned at the outset, were crucial in securing these funds. So with support from our partners, we received a $350,000 Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant from Carolyn's department, as well as $150,000 in state opera funds. And we expect to receive an additional $200,000 in Community Preservation Act funds 
to complete the design of the park. And I just want to show you if I can, although the way I'm going, I'm not so sure. Uh, this is an excerpt from our recent State of the City address that highlights this project. While on the subject of water, the award-winning Malden River Works project is worth watching. Last year, we made incredible progress on this collaborative project to redesign the DPW yard and develop a new climate-resilient public park along the river. With support from our partners at the Friends of the Malden River, Mystic River Watershed Association, MIT, and the Malden River Works Steering Committee, we received a $350,000 Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant, $150,000 in state opera funds, and expect to receive an additional $200,000 in Community Preservation Act funds to complete the design of the park. This spring, there will be a series of events celebrating Malden culture on the river, previewing what's to come when the park is finally complete. As part of this project, we are also working on plans to reinvigorate the Public Works headquarters. We will be proposing to improve the facade of the building, the yard area, and the interior elements that serve our staff. When the two projects come together, we'll have a reimagined waterfront in a renovated building and surrounding yard that better serves the hardworking men and women of Public Works while also providing a more appropriate gateway to our city. So again, let me end by how I began, which is finally we have the resources and now we're going to put them to good use. And again, that wouldn't have happened without EBC, uh, UMass, and all of you on this call. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Christensen. Um, the, I've had the pleasure of you know, observing the Malden River Works project uh, you know, from afar. And, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of really great community involvement, a great equity focus. Um, you know, it's been definitely a, a pleasure to, to watch. Um, thank you to all of our speakers um, for providing that great information. Um, we had a lot of questions come through in the chat and we have about 15 minutes for um, before our break. Um, so I'll just pose a couple of questions um, that that came through. So I think uh, Mayor Christensen's project in Malden is a really great example of how municipalities can partner with nonprofits and other organizations to move projects forward. One of our participants uh, specifically asked in the chat about opportunities for nonprofits to leverage federal funds. Um, and someone else was curious about private property owners. So um, I don't know if this might be best posed to Akasha or Brendan, um, but are there opportunities for non-municipal and non-governmental bodies to access this funding directly or is partnerships the best mode? I can jump in from my perspective, uh, Carolyn. So there are opportunities for um, nonprofits to access this funding directly through the state appropriation bills of the funding. Uh, Mayor Christensen mentioned, you know, state legislators have been working hard to both work with municipal advocates, but as well as nonprofit advocates. Uh, and there was about $3.7 million earmarked for such organizations to make use of this funding uh, and the bill that had passed in December, 2021. Uh, so I included a link specifically to the earmark page. I would look through that to see some organizations that have already received funding. Uh, and potentially, if you are an organization that would like to propose a project, uh, reaching out to your state legislators and referencing some of those that have already been authorized. Uh, but otherwise, municipalities can subgrant the ARPA funds that they receive locally to nonprofits in their community to facilitate eligible uses of the funding, uh, specifically with regards to, you know, in this case, um, on the water and sewer infrastructure front. And so I would strongly encourage you as well to reach out to your municipal partners um, if you have any projects in mind or if even just offering uh, potential services you can provide to the municipality because it's not too difficult for them to subgrant this funding to nonprofits, um, but obviously you'd be subject to the same eligible use restrictions. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, we have a, another question about um, uh, for for the mayor. Um, it looks like that you know you're able to meet so regularly with your uh, the senators and representatives um, to help with those earmarks. Um, can you share a little bit more about about that practice? Uh, any advice for for other municipalities looking to do something similar? Just have to be determined. Uh, there's so many things going on. What you can't lose sight of is how important communication, communication, communication is. And so that's why one would think after several years in office that you might just call your legislator when there's a need, but we painstakingly make sure that we meet on a set schedule that's uh, put in place a year in advance, every three months, if not sooner, if something else comes up, but every three months at a minimum to go over what they're doing and they go over what we're doing. And I am certain that if it were not for that, some of the things that I outlined today would not be happening. So it's just, it's doggedness. You just, you just have to stay with it, no matter what time of the year it is, because there are some downtimes but even when those occur, you still have to be communicating. That's great, great advice, thank you. Um, so some more spe specific eligibility questions, um, you know, especially when it comes to water infrastructure. Um, so either Kasha or Brendan, are, are there opportunities for, for improvements on, on private infrastructure? Um, again, is, would the key there be partnerships or are there other ways to access funding? Yeah, I think the majority of IRIJA funds that are going towards water infrastructure are going to be put into the, the state drinking water and clean water revolving funds. So the elig eligibility requirements that are associated with those funds would also apply to those IIJA funds as well. And I, I'm not as familiar with the details of, of those. Um, so yeah, I, I would recommend looking into the requirements around the revolving funds. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, can, you know, there were a lot of talks about implementation, like funding for implementation of projects, um, but can funds be applied to planning processes that would then lead to uh, more improvement projects, whether that's the water and, and other infrastructure? Um, so, so where do planning po uh, processes fall here? That's my understanding, uh, at least with the ARPA funds. But one thing I'll note with, um, as you keep in mind when these projects would be completed. So the regulations of the ARPA funding, uh, specifically the state and local fiscal recovery funds mandate that funding must be obligated by December 31st, 2024, uh, but funds themselves can actually be spent through the end of calendar year 2026. So if you are using the funding towards a large water infrastructure project or sewer infrastructure project in your municipality, the project would essentially need to be set in motion formally before 2024, but you would have until 2026, the end of 2026, to use this funding to complete the project. Um, so that's worth noting. Yes, the funding could then be used for the early stages, the design process, but keep in mind what the timeline of the project is uh, as you try to make a budget of where federal funds could factor in. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and then another eligibility question. Um, what about funding for those quasi public agencies like MWRA, Boston Water and Sewer, um, bodies like that? Uh, I believe that would be similar to the nonprofits where okay. the funding pools currently exist at the state level and the local level. Um, municipalities can sub grant and then uh, state government obviously will work through the appropriations process uh, for the remaining $2 billion of the funding. So that would be working with state legislators and other relevant state level stakeholders to have such uh, earmarks or other qualifying programs included in the next appropriations bill. Gotcha, sounds good. Um, another um, more logistical related question, um, but it's a very important one that um, you know, we talk about a lot of MVP, is match funding required uh, for any of these programs? Um, and, and what might those requirements be? 
So on, on the infrastructure bill front, yes, in many cases, matching funds are required. And we know that the Massachusetts state legislature, or I'm sorry, the governor is looking to file a transportation bond bill soon that would address the need for Massachusetts to make some of those matching requirements. Um, I think one other, and Brendan can speak to this in more detail as well, but one other thing to note, you know, as communities are kind of navigating, you know, should I use ARPA funds for this project? Should I seek infrastructure dollars for this project? Is that in, in the, the final rule for ARPA, um, Treasury did clarify that ARPA funds generally can be used for matching dollars for um, IIJA funds. So I think, you know, water is one place where there is a lot of overlap between ARPA and IIJA. So I definitely encourage communities to think strategically about, you know, how could maybe ARPA dollars be a down payment on, on a larger water project and then IIJA be used for some of those longer term, term funds. Um, so just, just something to think about um, if water is something that's top of mind. Yeah, that's uh, definitely, as Kasha emphasized, it's. Uh allowable for municipalities and the state government to use the state and local fiscal recovery funds as the match portion, um, with the only caveat being if the grant for which you are applying for restricts the use of federal funding for a local or state match. Um, and so there is one other relevant point that I would like to talk to. I didn't talk to it as much here, but I saw as the chat questions come up, uh, NASA had referenced it. So on with the local fiscal recovery funds, there's a revenue loss provision, which is one of the eligible uses. Um, you can calculate based on municipal revenue factors, how much you would be able to put towards general government services, which is a very broad umbrella of, you know, pretty much anything a municipality would typically spend on. They could use funding within that revenue loss allowance for, um, or you can take the assumed $10 million revenue loss allowance. And so this is really notable at the municipal level when you think about matching grants, because theoretically then funding within that $10 million allowance could be put toward a whole host of matching grants, regardless of whether or not the grant itself fits within the other eligible uses outlined um, in the guidance. And then why this is also notable to, uh, to NASA's point at the state level. Uh, so we also have a pretty large revenue loss ceiling with which we are able to operate and then uh, state funding has been used as well as, you know, with the price tag of $4 billion for the most recent spending bill. Uh, that was a mix of about two and a half billion in federal funding and one and a half billion in state funding. And so that is really worth keeping in mind because while the guidance itself is pretty expansive for which type of projects can be included, uh, the standard allowance, the revenue loss allowance, um, and then infusing state dollars into certain programs really expands the eligible uses within those two uh, streams to pretty much anything that a government would typically spend on. So there's a whole host of flexibility uh, for municipalities and state governments under those provisions. Great, thank you. Uh, since everyone here, you know, this is a climate adaptation forum, um, and all of you have touched on elements of climate resilience and how these funds can be used for that. Um, we have a few questions uh, more specifically about those, uh, you know, resiliency requirements. Um, so first, what are resilience requirements to receive uh, some of this federal funding, either through infrastructure or ARPA? And if a project meets um, certain standards, like sea level rise standards and other design guidelines, could it be eligible for multiple streams if you know, since climate resiliency is such an overarching category, how, how does that kind of play out? I can take a stab at this from, from the infrastructure front. Um, it is, you know, really variable depending on the specific formula program that you are looking at or discretionary grant program that, that you are looking at. But I think, you know, with the infrastructure bill, there are still more uncertainties. ARPA, you know, is, is a known known right now. We know the parameters of that funding. So given that, you know, we're still waiting for some of the parameters for those discretionary grant programs to, to come out, I think it's really advantageous for communities and coalitions and organizations to be thinking about how projects meet those multiple goals so that, you know, when 
when, as the NOFOs start rolling out, you can be ready to move that forward in, in through the, the grant application process. Um, I, you know, on the transportation side, since that's what I'm, I'm most familiar with, there is continuing work to bake climate resiliency into state of good repair needs. So I think, you know, if you're looking at a transportation project that is has a really strong resiliency focus, I think that that's a great example of how you can seek potentially transportation funds, but also, you know, look to some of these other um, resiliency opportunities that are included in IIJA. But um, yes, thank you. Sorry for the, <laughs> the acronyms. Um, yeah, so I think to the extent that your, your project does meet multiple goals, I, I think that's a really good strategy for, for being ready for whenever those grant opportunities do become available. Great, that's really helpful. Oh, Brendan, did you wanna add? Yeah, I can just chime in quickly. So as <laughs> you know, Kasha mentioned, the infrastructure bill is more so thinking about resiliency at a macro level. Um, within your own community, water and sewer infrastructure are the only real um, aside from the flexible funding and the revenue loss are the real, the best streams to enact, you know, changes in your infrastructure locally to meet climate resilience, resiliency goals. And those are really, if you do end up as a municipality utilizing this funding for water and sewer infrastructure, that's pretty much the standard that is set of, you would need to demonstrate how, and you know, just by virtue of modernizing your infrastructure, that would make it more climate resilient. Um, but otherwise, think about creative ways to, if using this funding for water and sewer infrastructure, uh, address some resiliency goals uh, locally. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for about uh, one more question. Um, I'd like to direct to this next one first to Mayor Christensen, and then if Kasha or Brendan have some uh, advice to throw in, um, of course, you're more than welcome. Um, so with this influx of local funding, I mean, governments, local governments, municipal staff might end up with more projects than ever to manage. Um, do you, and, and a lot of municipalities are already you know, relatively understaffed. Do you have advice for municipalities in terms of how to how to handle and manage, you know, all of these great new opportunities that we have, you know, as um, you know, how has Malden kind of handled a, more of an influx in, in projects um, so far? By going above and beyond. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So as a result, I know it's challenging, but we you just have to dig deep. So for instance, on our end, we're doing uh, infrastructure meetings every Monday morning uh, from March until the end of the construction season. Uh, that's just one example. You know, I talked about the legislative meetings. Every couple of months, we're getting together for an hour or so. It's just, that's what you have to do. Uh, in, you know, times when we can't just, you know, come up with the resources to do it, we're con contracting as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep great resource yeah. yeah yeah it's a lot of work uh it's definitely yep. a lot of work but it sounds yep. like you're, you're making great strides i would just add to that carolyn you know in, in addition to setting up those really great internal processes and structures that the mayor referenced uh, i also you know just have to make a plug for working regionally as as well um look, looking to your partners and, and neighbors as um you know as they're going through asking the same questions about grant requirements and you know, what's the timeline for, for a different program? I, I think, you know, that coupled with, with the local approach that, that Mayor Christensen articulated, I think is definitely a, a recipe for success when it comes to taking advantage of all of the different funds that are available and just making sure, you know, we're all making the most efficient use of, of the different funds given their different parameters and different local and regional goals. So I think that that approach um, is definitely one worth considering. And a uh, note I'll make for the nonprofits who are especially tied in within uh, your municipality. So in my free time, I'm a city councilor in Beverly. And one thing we've tried to do is really bring those nonprofit leaders to the table when discussing how best to deploy the funding. Uh, so I would just encourage you, if you have ideas for how you could partner with your municipal government in using this funding uh, to achieve a goal of your nonprofit, please be proactive and reach out to the municipal leaders in your community. I think that's the best way to advocate uh, and maybe even underscore needs that folks in City Hall may not have really fully understood, but you at the nonprofit level are seeing uh, much more granularly. So definitely uh, 
municipalities are still going through the planning process. It's, as Mayor Christensen mentioned, a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, and folks are trying to be deliberate. So definitely now is the time to uh, get involved and speak up. Well, thank you all so much. I think that leaves us on a great note um, for our, our break. I know there are a lot of, of more questions in the chat about specific eligibility, specific projects, questions. Um, so as Jackson has said, we will be sending out the slides and all of the presenters had some great resource links on the slides that I would recommend you check out. And if not, um, you know, I believe everyone's contact information is, is on those as well. Um, so please feel free to continue to ask these really, really great questions. Um, I would just like to reintroduce Alex Papali, who is one of the forum co-chairs and political director for Center for Economic Democracy. So Alex, uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to you to take us to our next panel. Thank you so much, Jackson. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, after that uh, spirited uh, discussion in the, um, the, the first panel, it's so exciting to have the guests we have lined up in round two here. <clears throat> um, just uh, a, a bit of context about me. Uh, I'm with, as Jackson said, with the Center for Economic Democracy. Um, we are uh, members of a national network called this, the uh, United Frontline Table, UFT, which has been intervening on <clears throat> these questions of Justice 40 uh, that we're gonna hear about from our speakers uh, and other federal investments, um, you know, putting some, uh, some parameters on this investment to maximize uh, benefit for uh, you know, communities that have been marginalized for a long time. So <clears throat> through that, um, through that experience, <clears throat> excuse me, through that experience, uh, you know, we've had a, a chance to uh, see some of the sausage making up close and uh, we're hoping our panelists can help demystify all of that. I <clears throat> uh, just want to thank uh, my, my fellow co-hosts as well for helping put this, this excellent panel together. So First up on our panel, we have Samantha Medlock, who's a um, senior counsel uh, with the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis uh, to give us a, uh, a view from inside Congress. Okay, over to you, Samantha. Great, thank you very much, Alex. And it's delightful to be with you all. Um, I am Samantha Medlock and everyone calls me Sam, so please do. Um, I've been with the, with the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis for about three years and I can provide um, that view from Capitol Hill. Um, I, it's an honor to um, be a part of this panel. And I uh, really wanna thank the EBC and, um, and UMass Boston for convening this great and really timely event. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll get into uh, some of the uh, content here. But I do wanna start uh, by providing um, a little bit of background on the select committee itself. We were created by resolution in the 116th Congress, the previous Congress, to advance um, recommendations for actions Congress can be taking to confront the climate crisis. Um, and in June of 2020, um, we issued a climate crisis action plan as a majority staff report uh, with more than uh, 700 specific recommendations for legislative and policy actions that uh, Congress can be taking to both um, decarbonize the economy, reduce emissions and advance um, uh, renewables, as well as strengthen the nation's preparedness um, for the impacts of the climate crisis that we can no longer avoid. Um, and we're making uh, some, some progress here. Now, if there's a big theme of my remarks, it's gonna be this, that uh, we are making progress, but we have a long, long way to go. Um, we have enacted more than 200 of those policy solutions through various bills, and you know, we'll get into that in a little more detail, uh, but it would include the American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the National Defense Authorization Act, and more. Um, we've also uh, gotten quite a lot of work done uh, just through the House of Representatives. Um, but the president has signed into law measures to strengthen uh, the electricity grid, to support electric vehicles and advance environmental justice, uh, to strengthen community resilience to floods, droughts, wildfires, 
Um, through the NDAA, we've done some good work on helping our military installations get closer to net zero and improve preparedness to extreme weather, as well as working on uh, energy storage. Um, but just through the House of Representatives, we've also advanced another 377 um, actions to, uh, to, uh, to deal with climate, including expanding tax incentives for homeowners and businesses um, uh, looking to retrofit or make, make changes to increase their resiliency or to reduce their emissions and, and achieve greater energy efficiency. Uh, we've made great investments in frontline communities um, strengthening housing, public buildings, and infrastructure against climate impacts, and doing that with real intentionality to reach our vulnerable communities, including helping them access grants and loans for, um, for economic development. Um, we'll get into a little bit more here, but what I'd, what I'd note is that while the House is able to act, we really need the Senate to follow through. Um, uh, so some of these examples of what we've gotten enacted with the, with the bipartisan infrastructure law, the American Rescue Plan, and the NDAA um, uh, really do move the dial in ways that are uh, you know, transformational for the American people. Uh, the American Rescue Plan is, is really part of, our, uh, of the president's response uh, to the COVID emergency and the associated economic emergency, investing $100 million um, in environmental justice grants, including measures to strengthen air quality monitoring and to address uh, disproportionate environmental and public health harms and, and risks in vulnerable populations. So although the American Rescue Plan is not necessarily a climate adaptation bill, uh, it did deploy funding uh, that communities can be using toward um, some of those ends. Um, of course, the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, also is not a, a, a climate bill, uh, but included tremendous investments in um, resources that can be helping our states, local governments, tribes, and territories um, strengthen their resilience and preparedness. I won't go through this in, in you know, line by line detail. Uh, we'll, we'll be hearing from, from Crystal later, later in the panel um, about this and the sorts of next steps that communities can be taking to tap into these resources. Um, but, uh, but these are significant levels of funding. Um, including for the first time funding uh, state hazard mitigation loan programs that, uh, that we know can be used to leverage um, projects and strengthen resilience. Um, also unprecedented levels of funding to support our tribal communities. Um, I would note that it's, it's a fraction of what's needed, uh, but it is that down payment toward um, modernized and climate ready communities. Um, we are gonna be, I think from Congress's perspective, keeping a really close eye on implementation and making sure that these resources are deployed um, in, a, in an accelerated way and in ways that, uh, that, uh, that create change on the ground. Um, but I, I think the urgency that everyone is feeling around these impacts is, is gonna be part of what we see in an administration going about that implementation in ways that achieve its goals. Uh, getting back into some of these highlights, uh, the, the investments for uh, the uh, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, or BRIC, as well as through FEMA's flood mitigation uh, programs, um, and those, those grants, I think, are, are going to be significant, and we know FEMA is, is working hard to move those funds. Um, Army Corps uh, and the work on the flood uh, risk reduction programs going through uh, multiple line items under their authorities, both toward projects, but also technical assistance and ecosystem restoration. Uh, significant funding moving to advance the nation's um, science and coastal risk management enterprise uh, through NOAA, as well as work uh, through the Natural Resources Conservation Service at USDA. Um, you know, the, we, we have heard that this is the, the largest investment in clean drinking water in American history including significant funding to replace lead service lines. Um, so there's, there's really quite a lot to work with here. Um, and uh, I, I think also the work on ecosystem restoration and resilience on, on transportation um, and work on our grid is gonna be um, very important. So as, as communities are uh, looking to kind of pre-position and figure out how to go after these funds, um, it's, it's worth looking what, at what's happening at the intersection of different programs 
and also it ways to take this kind of funding and attract additional private investment um, in more of a kind of a blended finance approach. And we could get into that more in the Q&A. Uh, but I really want to shine a, a spotlight on uh, the work of the bipartisan infrastructure law on wildfire risk. Um, it is a, uh, a deeply concerning, um, really urgent threat that is now um, essentially year round. Um, and, uh, and it is an area that I think we have been working to real pri really prioritize here on the Hill, um, in addition to the other threats and hazards. Uh, but wildfire has been a really tough one, especially to try to address risk um, on public lands or in our national forests, but also in the wildland urban interface where, uh, where communities and the built environment are, are meeting forests. Um, and, and this can be a very challenging space because it's dynamic, right? Some of these areas uh, can, can depend on everything from soil moisture uh, to more seasonal forecasts. Uh, but this is where these investments in reducing wildfire risk, especially in the wildland urban interface and community uh, planning and defense is, is uh, working to respond to that, as well as addressing the threats to our nation's grid and the threats posed by our nation's electricity grid. Um, quickly, I just want to uh, note the Defense Authorization Act. Sometimes it, it doesn't always attract as much attention for the adaptation and resilience practitioner community, uh, but, but we really want to point to the progress here, especially in um, helping our, our military uh, uh, preparedness to the growing threats of wildfire and floods. Um, many of us carry in our hearts uh, the, the soldiers uh, um, that have been lost um, on uh, training exercises um, in flash floods. Uh, and, um, and the idea of, of deepening the collaboration between our installation commanders and the surrounding community also gave rise uh, to amendments that made it into the, the final National Defense Authorization Act with strong bipartisan support. Um, so good progress there. Um, and the time I've got left, because again, we'll get into a lot more of this in the Q&A. Uh, obviously, we've got more work to do here. And the climate provisions of the Build Back Better Act is a very important priority for the Select Committee and, and the caucus. Um, and you know, many of these pieces do attract good bipartisan support. Uh, we are looking to these tax um, uh, uh, incentives, the tax credit extensions and expansions for renewable uh, sources, but, um, but also uh, uh, changing the tax barriers that are inhibiting even homeowners for making the kind of changes to their homes that can make them more resilient if those, uh, if those grants from the state or from private resources are treated like taxable income. So it's these kinds of tax reforms that need to get lifted up. Um, of course, we, uh, uh, we're really excited to get the, the Civilian Climate Corps across uh, to advance more work on climate and weather um, and a lot more work that can be done on flood and coastal. Technical assistance is at the heart of this. I think for every dollar we're spending on the built environment, we really need to be doubling down on technical assistance to bring these resources more within reach of communities and um, of course, a lot more. So next steps, um, bipartisan infrastructure law implementation. We're gonna hear a lot about that. We already have. Um, we can talk about that more in the Q&A. And, and again, you know, getting across these provisions of the Build Back Better Act, as well as America Competes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up there and really look forward to hearing from uh, my fellow panelists. But uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to provide this view from Capitol Hill. I think the news is good, but we've got a long way to go. Thanks very much. And thank you, Sam, <clears throat> for uh, you know that overview, and also for your work to uh, usher through these investments uh, in, in Congress. I hope we'll have a chance in the in Q and A to talk about what else might be in the offing. Um, next up, uh, we're so happy to have Crystal Lehman, uh, Deputy Director of for, for Climate Resilience with the White House uh, CEQ, the Council for uh, Council of Environmental Quality, from the Executive Office of the President. Um, and over to you, Crystal. Hi, folks. Happy Friday. Um, I'm so pleased to be here with you all. This is a really great topic. And I think a really good segue from what Sam was just referring to in regards to the legislative priorities and legislative pieces that have been coming through. Uh, so I'm Crystal Lehman, the Deputy Director for Climate Resilience at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. 
And I'm pleased to speak with you all today on the ongoing efforts in the Biden administration to really strengthen the U.S. to be more resilient against extreme weather events. So uh, we're really excited to hear the administration is already working diligently to lead efforts that will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions nationwide and address climate change. Um, this includes in the beginning of administration, a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030, and that is half the emissions by 2030. So very exciting for us. However, we do heavily recognize the ongoing climate change crisis we're experiencing now, uh, which is why the administration is investing heavily on resilience efforts nationwide. Uh, and so I don't have to kind of tell this group how important it is. Um, we have seen pretty heavily the billion dollar loss uh, annually that occurs and it's really has skyrocketed over the last 50 years. Last year alone, uh, the US faced about 20 such events with a total package and price tag of $145 billion. So we know there are solutions, right? Um, many of you may already know the National Institute of Building Science says that every dollar spent on pre-disaster mitigation that is before a disaster by the federal government will save $6 on recovery costs. And these investments are very important, which is why when Sam mentioned the $1.2 trillion package is very important to us. It includes $50 billion in climate resilience investments. And that is historic. That is incredible and will directly be contributing to building resilience and reducing risk for communities. Um, so what's exciting about uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law in particular, not only is it a watershed moment, but also we're trying to make sure and ensure that uh, communities on the ground understand the type of opportunities that are available. So in January, the White House released the first edition of its bipartisan infrastructure law guidebook. Uh, and this is to help state, local, tribal, territorial governments unlock and understand the benefits from historic investments in our nation's infrastructure, which includes timelines and also funding amounts. We also are already active. We announced investments in more than 14 billion of this funding for fiscal year 2022, and that equals uh, 500, oh, over 500 projects around 52 states and territories. And also what's important is that these investments will further deliver on the President's Justice 40 commitments. And that is the commitment to ensure that 40% of the overall benefits from federal investments in climate and clean energy flow to disadvantaged communities in building their local economies. Uh, and we're all aware, of course, uh, the frequent disasters are increasing. Uh, this is why we've actually taken what we call a whole of government approach. So this whole of government approach really was established through Executive Order 14,008, uh, which also pointed to the fact that we need to increase resilience of impacts of climate change. The executive order set up the first National Climate Task Force, which is chaired by Gene uh, McCarthy, the National Climate Advisor, and also cabinet level, cabinet level leaders, so principals, across 21 federal agencies. And this aims to mobilize the administration's implementation, not just um, on resilience, but also on climate change uh, as a whole. In addition, the White House established five new interagency working groups to enhance climate resilience drought relief, flood resilience, coastal resilience, extreme heat, and wildfire resilience. All five take very seriously this whole government approach to tackling climate change issues and also facilitate partnerships between agencies as a really convening body to understand what's on the ground, what's needed to be going forward or to be successful. So for example, the Climate Resilience Interagency Working Group has been working to coordinate efforts to better address the needs of local communities to implement coastal resilience activities. Um, this has really been done by aligning federal dollars with future climate data, because we understand that America's coast concentrate almost 40% of the population and only 10% of the country's land. And, and that's very important to understand because where people live is, is really their safe place and understanding how we can protect that area is a priority for us. We also have the Flood Resilience Interagency Working Group, where we're working to support agencies on the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard, also known as FFRMS, which was reestablished through executive order uh, last year as well, uh, which is a policy to improve the resilience of the nation's communities and federal assets against current and future flooding. And this is a whole government approach to implementing the flood standard to um, provide data and tools and other items in order to be successful in building resilience against flood. Um, 
Also, uh, wildfires are many disaster impacts. Wildfires is a really heavy one as well. Um, it's been a growing hazard in the United States. Uh, and it has been a huge challenge also due to the fact of increasing extreme heat and drought. And this is being led by Department of Interior, US, uh, Department of uh, Agriculture, and also OMB Office of Manage Management and Budget to identify opportunities as well as enhance wildfire resilience and connecting science agencies to land management and fire management agencies to better address this, this increased cost um, to our, our community. Uh, what's exciting is that the Wildfire Resilience Interagency Group established uh, per law, uh, actually through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Wildfire, Wildfire Mitigation and Management Commission, which is tasked with studying and recommending strategies to prevent mitigate and manage wildfires and also best restore lands effectively affected by the wildfires. Uh, also very important to note is that while we're working inten intentionally with these agencies, we also are tackling the fact that the, those that are most affected are the ones that are most in need and those are the disadvantaged communities. The most historically undeserved and overburdened communities face the most challenge rebuilding and recovering from natural disasters. And these communities bear a disproportionate burden from extreme weather events. They often, often have challenged even accessing resources. So uh, at the federal level, um, the administration established the Justice 40 initiative, which really goes a long way in addressing some of these issues, um, especially addressing 40% of overall benefits from federal investments. And already we have put out interim guidance on Justice 40. Uh, we announced the creation of Justice 40 pilot programs and these are pilots identifying 21 priority programs on the federal level to meet we begin enhancing benefits. And one of those, as Sam mentioned, um, were some FEMA programs, so which includes FEMA's flood mitigation assistance, which received $3.5 billion over five years, uh, which is very exciting for us to really address some of the issues that are considered during flood hazards. Um, and in addition, um, we were able to see with HUD's community development block grant programs, the CDBG program, like those, those programs being able to address the needs of the community when it comes to disasters uh, recovery, as well as addressing disadvantaged community needs. We also recognize the need for environmental justice uh, and engagement and consultation, which is why the White House created the first ever White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, and we also call the Weej Act. Uh, it is made up of 26 longtime environmental justice at environmental justice advocates and experts from across the country with experience working on these issues on the ground. We are also pleased to have established a new WEJAC Climate Resilience Working Group, which is going to provide the White House and federal, federal agencies recommendations on the type of support disadvantaged communities need when it comes to building more resilient communities. And in addition, in latest uh, recent events, which we're also very excited about, uh, and very busy. Um, we just released the new climate and economic justice screening tool. This tool includes data from FEMA on risks and will also help support the Justice 40 initiative to inform decision making. Uh, currently, there is a 60 day comment period to provide feedback on this tool. And yesterday, we actually announced training webinars and public listening sessions for the tool as well. So, a lot of activity on this front, and we're really excited to engage the public on it. So to sum up um, what I have shared with you all today, climate resilient solutions are attainable and feasible and incredibly necessary. Uh, with the IP, IPCC report, the climate change shows that there's already activity occurring and we really need to be addressing it now. So we're working uh, not only on the carbon emissions front, but also on the preparedness front, the climate impacts that we're already seeing today. So we really do need to invest in communities because Communities are the backbone of, of our society here and really to some people's survival of being able to live in their community and thrive in their community. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Alex and looking forward to your questions as well. Thank you so much, Crystal. Uh, obviously you're, you're juggling a lot. Your team is uh, helping to uh, shepherd you know, a lot of different programming. Uh, appreciate your efforts. Um, obviously, the, the, the devil's in the details and how that's all implemented. So we're going to hear from a couple of speakers now about uh, that side of the ledger. Um, uh, Justin Schott is uh, joining us from the University of Michigan. He's project manager 
uh, of the Energy Equity Project in the Urban Energy Justice Lab at the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. Over to you, Justin. Well, thanks, Alex. Uh, it's really great to be here on this panel and to connect with this network today. Um, so I'm Justin Schott, uh, he, him, and I'm based here at University of Michigan, which occupies the lands of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi people. Um, and before coming to this work, uh, I was working in Detroit with a nonprofit called EcoWorks, uh, working on energy justice and environmental justice issues, and really seeing firsthand the impacts of energy poverty um, and energy insecurity, uh, being in people's homes that had lost a furnace from a flooded basement, for instance, and then living without heat uh, for years to come because they didn't have the resources to replace that. Um, so this work has been uh, started by Dr. Tony Reams, who's now an advisor uh, for energy justice in DOE and continues under Dr. Kyle White, who's a member of the White House EJ Advisory Council. So the Energy Equity Project um, is creating a national framework to measure equity. And we're doing that with a really robust methodology, uh, but with the goal that we are driving benefits to BIPOC and frontline communities. So I'm gonna just give a quick overview of that work and then speak uh, to the climate and economic justice screening tool that Crystal mentioned and uh, how we see that lining up with the Justice 40 implementation. So we're working with four pillars of energy justice. So recognition, this is about the identity and the demographics, uh, as well as some of the historical disparities that communities have experienced. Um, procedural justice, this is looking at what access do people have to participate in planning and decision-making. Distributional justice, this is considering how the benefits and burdens are distributed. Uh, and then a restorative component. So thinking about what do we need to do um, to protect against the harms that have happened in the past um, from continuing to happen in the future. So we're developing a big framework for this. This is something that will apply at the national level. Uh, don't have time to really get into this here, but it's gone through a lot of deep engagement work. We've got 50 practitioners and researchers and community members uh, working on work groups over several months. So we'll be rolling this out in June. Um, it'll include a national map with census tract level equity scores. Um, it'll include guidance on integrating qualitative information and story mapping. And it's also going to include some tools and best practices. So for instance, with Justice 40, um, is 40% 40 of the benefits really the target for disadvantaged communities or can we be going above that? Uh, that's the floor. What would it look like if we were striving for 70% of the benefits or 90% of the benefits uh, to be going to these communities to correct for all of those decades of disenfranchisement? So we've been doing some analysis on the Justice 40 program um, and some related initiatives. So this started with Build Back Better. Um, and we went through this line by line as, as best we could and drew on uh, some of the work of Evergreen Action and some other groups and looked at the budgets there and asked, does this align with the goal of Justice 40 of distributing the benefits um, to frontline communities? And our analysis was that of the 555, sorry, billion um, that was in Build Back Better, um, you know, we were only seeing about 82 billion that we would say went uh, to Justice 40 benefits. And to get to 40%, they needed to have 222 billion there. Um, so we have this $140 billion gap. And then we went out and we surveyed community and we said, you know, here's the current budget. Um, if we were to reallocate some of these funds, how would you want that to look um, in order to line up with the Justice 40 baseline? Again, this is a floor. Um, you know, we'd much rather see more than uh, 222 billion there aligned. Um, but this is the kind of analysis that we've been doing, digging, digging into some of the numbers. Um, another thing that we've been looking at is definitions for environmental justice populations. And this is something that Massachusetts has um, from its 2021 climate bill. Uh, tracking all of the ways that these thresholds have been designed. Um, a lot of really great work has come out of New York and New York's uh, New York Renews Coalition was actually uh, really 
the developer of this Justice 40 concept, which then got adopted um, by the Biden administration. So they've gotten to about 45 indicators, uh, about half of those looking at environmental and climate burdens, um, which you see here. And then the other half looking at population characteristics and health vulnerabilities. Um, so I know Elizabeth has a much better uh, sense for how this has all come together, but I just wanna lift up um, this race and ethnicity column here um, and the proposal to have twice the weighting um, for both Black and Latinx households uh, and getting that represented there. I think that's, that's really critical. Um, so we've got this work happening at the state level, right, as it often does, uh, bottom-up leadership informing federal priorities and federal action. Um, this is just a look at the distribution there from New York. Um, and so that's all kind of fed into this process of developing the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, or CGEST, as I'll refer to it. Um, so if you just search for this, you'll be able to, to get in and explore, and you can get census tract level data there. Um, and it gives you that on these eight different uh, variables or, or categories, so climate, clean energy, transit, affordable housing, um, legacy pollution, clean water, health burdens, and then this training and workforce development component. And so if you click on a census tract, this is one from Flint. Um, this is the kind of information that you'll get. You'll see the percentiles uh, for all of these 21 indicators that are there, as well as um, they'll be highlighted in blue if they're above the threshold. And uh, generally the thresholds here are um, above the 90th percentile um, is what's needed, along with uh, a threshold of above the 65th percentile for low income um, is what will qualify a census tract uh, as a disadvantaged community. So here's what that looks like um, by states, and you can see the percentage of tracts um, that are there nationwide. It's about 29% of all census tracts uh, in this current beta version qualify as disadvantaged, um, and that's covering about 93 million Americans. Um, so some of these may be places where you expected to see uh, higher percentages, others may be a little bit surprising, um, depending on how those, those indicators are shaping up. Um, just another list of that and a look at the population. I'm gonna move through this since you'll get access to the, the slides if you want more data, um, and I know Massachusetts is down here at number 36 um, with about 17.5% of the population in a disadvantaged tract. Uh, wanted to just mention that not all of the thresholds have the same impact. So a lot of the ones that you see here in red and orange, the workforce and health um, factors, most of the communities, if they're above those thresholds, um, are going to be disadvantaged tracts. And that's just kind of the structure of the screening tool. Um, but if we look below down at climate, at legacy pollution, at clean transit, um, we're seeing less than half of the communities that are exceeding those thresholds actually getting qualified as disadvantaged. So you could be in the 99th percentile for um, you know, exposure to diesel particulates, for instance, and just miss the uh, income threshold and not be included. So some real concerns there about how this is playing out currently. And I think um, just that reference to this being the beta form and having a couple of months to give public comment uh, is really critical as we're starting to get into this analysis. Um, most of the tracts actually you'll see do not cross a whole lot of thresholds. Um, many just cross one threshold and often that's just a workforce development one um, that doesn't really deal specifically with EJ issues at all. Um, almost all of the tracts that are qualified as low income are also qualified as disadvantaged. Uh, hardly any difference between those. Um, Gris did this analysis on race, um, and you can see a tract that's got majority BIPOC population is almost certainly going to be a disadvantaged tract as well. So uh, lots of contention there about race not being included uh, explicitly as a variable in the tool, but I think that's important to see how it's playing out and if that's actually lining up with this calculus that race uh, is getting represented through other variables. And that's, that's a big conversation to have. Um, here's another look at that. 
Um, and that's what we see bearing out in other states as well. This is from California. Uh, just a quick look and you can see it's mostly white households living in the cleanest neighborhoods and mostly BIPOC households living in the most polluted neighborhoods. Um, 15 was the maximum number of thresholds that was exceeded. This is in St. Louis. Um, and now just a couple of concerns or questions that come up uh, with the CGES tool. So got a number of really similar tracks. This is right on the Gulf Coast here. Um, some of these may differ just by a couple of uh, percentile points um, on the income category. And so that results in differences of whether they're designated or not. Um, should they be treated any differently? Do they really have different vulnerabilities? Um, that's, that's a question. Um, this is here in Suffolk County. We've got a couple of tracts, uh, one in Dorchester, another in North Quincy. And I don't know the areas uh, at all, but the North Quincy tract uh, ends up qualifying as disadvantaged because it's got this uh, linguistic isolation threshold uh, exceeded in the 94th percentile, whereas Dorchester does not, um, but scores higher in a lot of these other areas. So um, does that really make sense just from an eye test, the way that that plays out? Um, South Beach, it's another place that, that meets the threshold. I'm not sure if that's because of a uh, uh, population of people experiencing homelessness or billionaires not paying taxes, um, but that's on the map. Um, we can see some other strange differences uh, looking at building loss from climate change. Um, New York is supposedly way, way lower on that uh, than Nebraska, for instance. Um, don't know why, why that would be. So I think we need to take a look at some of the data sets that are the foundation of this. We've got some major data gaps. Uh, almost half the tracts are missing some form of their data for those 21 indicators. Uh, it's a particular issue for tribal areas. Um, and you can see that in California that many of the tribal areas, just because they don't have data, have not been represented as disadvantaged communities there. Um, and then we've got That's, issues. Yeah. Sorry, you're just about out of time. Um, okay. All right. I'm just closing here then. Great. And then the last thing, you know, a lot of this data that we have is not current. So this is uh, 2015 data that we have on energy and security from the RECs. So um, big issues there. I've got a number of questions here that are posed, um, but I'll just leave those for the slides and uh, look forward to more conversation. So thanks. No, thank you. Uh, that was really excellent. I'm, I'm so glad you were able to join us at short notice. I know a lot of the folks in our audience uh, appreciate getting into the granular details. Uh, I, I know you're supposed to be a, a dry academic and a, and a dispassionate researcher, but uh, I hope you'll be able to you know, sh just share your opinions on how any of this can be approved uh, later on in the discussion. Thanks, Justin. Um, okay, now over to Elizabeth Yampier, Executive Director of UpRose. Uh, Elizabeth, I think you may have missed uh, Nasser's original introduction. It was very dramatic. It was, uh, Brooklyn's finest DJ organizing, uh, but it, it's, uh, it's very true. Uh, Elizabeth is uh, you know, my compañera on the United Frontline table and uh, uh, helped to give us a view from the ground. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, Alex. And Justin, thank you for doing some of the work for me. Um, uh, it, you, you basically slimmed down my talk, right? Uh, so I share everybody. Thank you so much. Gracias uh, por la oportunidad to be here. Uh, I'm here in Brooklyn in Lenape uh, land. And uh, I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to bring a climate justice perspective and to share the multidimensional approach to addressing climate threats by frontline communities and also some of the challenges. I want to begin by really sort of rejecting the word resiliency. Resiliency for us means uh, to go back to what was normal, to bounce back. And bouncing back for us is, mount, is going back to a legacy of injustice before extreme weather events. Things were never normal and they were never good for our community. Often we use the word strength and social cohesion as we plan and move forward on developing the practices that are going to be able to put us on a path uh, to engage in deep climate adaptation and mitigation and doing the things that we need to do on the ground. 
Just yesterday, after de decades of advocating to bring offshore wind to South Brooklyn, my organization, Uprose, is really happy to see a climate justice victory in a community with a legacy of fossil fuel pollution and health disparities. We were excited to stand with NYSERDA and EDC and the mayor to announce an agreement uh, to transform the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal into one of the largest offshore wind port facilities in the nation. And I wanna share that with you because often people think about frontline communities as communities that have to be served and have to be provided with technical assistance and don't engage in building the kind of meaningful partnerships with us that are going to engage in transformation when we have the solutions. Uprose has also launched the first community-owned solar cooperative in the state of New York. Uh, we are co-founders of New York Renews, which is a coalition of 300 members across the state. Um, and we have this vision for the industrial waterfront, the same waterfront that has been responsible historically for exposing us to toxics and toxicants and making us sick and making it impossible for us to live whole lives uh, of a green reindustrialization that would move us away from fossil fuel extraction to an industrial waterfront that we become the vehicle for our climate future. Offshore wind is part of that. And we've got, and I should have done a PowerPoint presentation, but you can see the grid on our website, um, a phased out plan on how the largest significant maritime industrial area in the city of New York can not only benefit the local community, but also economically incentivize the region while moving us away from fossil fuel extraction. So I want you to think about communities as the places where the change is really happening. Our fingerprints are all over every single piece of legislation, in addition to infrastructure that is actually being put on the ground. We are de decommissioning peaker plants and replacing them with battery storage. We are operationalizing a just transition. So I want to share that with you because there's often this top-down way of thinking about power. When we are asking and demanding co-governance, we're not asking to be consulted with or listened to. We are asking to find out when we make recommendations, where they land, how they land, what the timetable is, and what it looks like for our communities. And that is a very different kind of governance uh, than we've had in the past. The past has been dated, conventional, patriarchal, top down, and one that doesn't really reflect what climate change is demanding us to do. Justice 40 is an initiative that is a direct result of grassroots, EJ led, and policy development that led to New York's landmark, landmark and nation leading climate law, the CLCPA, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And New York's Climate Justice Working Group, which I serve on and is responsible for the definition of the DACs, the disadvantaged communities, um, is this, it established as part of the CLCPA, just recently nipped this in the bud and made it lucid that we mean 40% of investments must be directed to DACs and that the ones that Justin just described in his presentation. And the DACs who will then determine what benefits in their community look like. Unfortunately, Justice 40 is still very extemporaneous and still quibbling over the language of benefits versus investments. And that's important to us because there's a very big difference between investments and benefits and who benefits and who access those resources and how those resources are allocated. We have been talking about investments and if Justice 40 had really mirrored in its entirety, um, the CEL CPA would have been a much, much, much stronger. And this is important because the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the bipartisan infrastructure package, will be sending approximately $27 billion to New York State. And while we have the mechanisms in place to make, sh make sure frontline communities get 40% of, of this money, this is not the case for every other state or territory in the United States. Couple this with the fact that the CEQ just announced a race neutral framework to address environmental racism, and we have a serious problem at the federal level. The sustained departure from the gains of the civil rights movement shows us shows up in who makes decisions, how resources are allocated, and who gets the lion's share in the midst of climate chaos coming towards those least responsible for it. So a race neutral approach to environmental racism is like trying to drive a car without wheels. It's not going to get us anywhere and certainly not where we need to go to increase environmental justice and decrease the legacy environmental racism and other practices and decisions that result in our communities being selected as energy pollution and economic sacrifice zones. 
grassroots organizations like UPROSE and base building organizations like the Climate Justice Alliance and the United Frontline Table have been pressing for bottom up trans local organizing approaches to climate policy. For this reason and many more, like the proliferation of false solutions, including carbon sequestration and hydrogen combustion. Bipartisan packages include billions of dollars for these technologies. The Justice 40 model does not prevent these unproven and expensive technologies from being built in our communities, locally derived bills like CLCPA does, while also ensuring that federal dollars are drawn down, they are direct, directly to frontline communities and organizations accountable for them. So while Justice 40 is providing some resources to our community, the fact is that the federal government is doubling down on false uh, corporate led false solutions that will turn our communities into sacrifice zones. So we need a different kind of governance. We need to understand what solutions look like regionally, locally, and really honor and respect the front line in making sure that we are able to operationalize visions like the one we have in Sunset Park for a green reindustrialization of the industrial waterfront. Um, we need effective and meaningful interagency coordination. Agencies don't talk to each other and certainly there are several agencies who have no history of working with frontline communities. Um, and there needs to be an internal audit and a review and evaluation of lifetime agency staff who doesn't follow leadership and really slows down the cogs so that we're unable to move as quickly and pivot as fast as we have to given the emergency that we're in right now. Um, we also really need to think about what all the factors that exist in, in, the, in the federal administration, whether or not and how many of them are charged to address issues that impact our communities. The truth is that you create the we jack, you have the knee jack, and you put us all in a room, and we have to share that space with industry and with, with academics and a bunch of other people, and so we're further minoritized, and then we are shown as the black and brown faces of an agenda that we really don't don't have a major role in shaping or influencing or changing. Um, and so there, there is a problem. Uh, that's really not the kind of governance that we're asking for. We want to see what it looks like for EPA, for DOI, for DOL, for the Na National Institutes of Health, OMB. We want to see a report card on how environmental justice and climate justice shows up in funding and decision making and regulating in everything that is going to impact the communities that are going to make up the majority of this country by 2042. And we know, for example, that agencies like FEMA have been responsible for displacement of frontline communities. And if anyone has asked any questions, they can just ask the people in Puerto Rico or the people in the Gulf South. And so there has to be accountability and there has to be a way or a process that holds agencies accountable to respond to the urgent needs that are being articulated by frontline communities. And right now, I feel like the federal administration has, is, is short of that. And we are hearing about all these buckets of work, all of the stuff that is being done that we think and we embrace is good, but it's really a start and it isn't really a bold, aggressive start that we need given what we know recurrent extreme weather events are going to do for us. In New York City, where I'm at in Sunset Park, you're in an industrial area where we have mapped all of the rooftops, all of the backyards, every single street to decarbonize an entire neighborhood of 130,000 people. That requires resources. And we have gotten the support of Senator Schumer, Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez, and others who have made sure that they have inve that they that investments have gone uh, for operationalizing offshore wind. And so that is an example of what communities like ours can do. This is a densely populated urban community that is in harm's way. And so if we can have small organizations like ours doing all of the work that we are carrying and literally transforming the landscape from doubling open space to stopping the siting of power plants and passing legislation that has made it possible for us to decommission um, peaker plants, then what then what can we expect from government? We expect more. And we expect that they work with us as partners and not as managers, not as people who, similar to corporations that hire community affairs people to manage our expectations are in the business of managing ours. We want partners that can say to us, this is where all the resources are coming from and we are sending it to you directly um, and, and we're going to take out the middleman. Um, this is really a time for deep transformation. Uh, and so I welcome 
um, the opportunity to be able to build uh, that kind of power structure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, you know, really important points you're raising and, um, and coming from a perspective of you know, having seen previous iterations of this federal funding uh, not play out exactly as, as planned. So I hope, uh, hope we can uh, hear from uh, Crystal and, and others about um, you know, how to, how to uh, respond to that. Um, before we get into the, the discussion, which I'm sure everyone's eager for, I just have a statement from uh, Kyle White, who is, um, he, uh, he introduces himself here, but uh, he wasn't able to join us today, but he sent uh, a statement. So, I'll just read it. It's a little slightly edited from what he sent for length, but uh, here it goes. My name is Kyle White. I'm a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Most of my work is on empowering indigenous climate justice. I work at the University of Michigan uh, with the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition and the Anishinaabek Caucus. And I'm a colleague of uh, Justin Schatz at the Energy Equity Program. I'm a member of the White House EJ Advisory Council, the WEJAC uh, was referenced earlier and serve as an author for the uh, IPCC and the US National Climate Assessment. However, what I'm sharing with you are my views based on what I know from my work at home and with tribal nations. Um, some folks I know have been under the impression that Justice 40 only applies to Build Back Better or other future bills. That's not true. Justice 40 applies now. It's in play now and has been since January 2021. On the federal side, some of the pieces um, for how Justice 40 will work are emerging. Um, as far as I understand, every federal agency is developing pilot programs for Justice 40, which combine spending with, uh, with whatever those agencies believe Justice 40 to mean at this time. Uh, there's also CEQ's interim guidance to agencies on how Justice 40 will work, which references specific programs. Um, okay, at the same time, we really can't wait for the federal government to complete its Justice 40 policies. We really can't wait. We have to deal directly with some of the realities many of us are all too familiar with, the needs and goals of many communities will not be tracked by or prioritize the new screening tool. States and other non-federal forms of government will impede or neglect the transition of funds from the federal government directly to communities. Industry contractors and other organizations will willfully ignore Justice 40 or seek to exploit the new funds for their own gains. The federal government is not handing us anything on a platter. We have to recognize the actual people, institutions, and organizations that are needed for the massive transfer of assets, resources, and capacities that Justice 40, 40 calls for. I've heard countless stories in Michigan and beyond about why this transfer is not yet occurring for communities living with environmental injustice. People in communities in mid-sized cities and rural areas know about some of the funding opportunities, but they do not have access to organizations or government agencies that are willing to serve as fiduciaries to steward the funds. There remains much mystery in how community-based organizations can themselves move into being their own fiduciaries so as to be empowered by Justice 40 instead of being ignored or dependent on fiscal sponsorship. Um, I'm going to just uh, skip through here. Uh, people I know out there are still having to push for private contractors and government agencies to take seriously the pathways for local workforce development. Uh, anxious contractors need to be accountable to communities instead of resorting to further transferring government investments outside of communities. Uh, while I've heard many people discuss the importance of minority serving institutions, such as tribal colleges and universities and historically black colleges and universities, the capacities of some of these incredible community serving institutions must be expanded to make up for generations of their not having anywhere near the research up resources of other public colleges and universities. Major changes are afoot, but there still remains uh, a number of unforced errors regarding direct access to resources in the form of uh, matching funds or initial investments that are hard to pony up or requirements that greatly limit how many communities can qualify for these resources. All of this speaks to the need to end this hourglass shaped approach, just 40 at the top of the hourglass are all the funds and assets and resources and the powers and influence of the federal government. At the bottom of the hourglass are all the communities who've been fighting every day for their communities continue, continuance and sustenance in the face of enduring generations of environmental injustice. At the middle of the hourglass is the thinnest part. And this would be the people, institutions and organizations that connect the communities directly to the funds and assets and resources of just 40. Right now in the middle of the hourglass, there is not nearly enough empowerment of the people, organizations, and institutions that are needed for the massive transfer that just what he calls for, not even close. CEQ is a small office. WEJAC has only 25 volunteers, and currently few federal resources are devoted to these activities. There's a select number of individuals and federal agencies devoted to Justice 40. There aren't the fiduciaries, technical capacities, workforce development programs, state and local policies that make it plain and clear how communities 
that have been cut out and harmed by every major period of major infrastructure. Investment in the US will not be left behind again by Justice 40. I'll just end it there. Just, you know, continuing some of the critique we heard from Elizabeth, um, from somebody who's, you know, in, in, on the inside here and, and has been for 10 years uh, at the ground level um, and is inside the, uh, the, the federal, you know, process for uh, rolling out Justice 40. So I suppose um, we, we can open up the discussion now. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder if, um, you know, Crystal or Sam, you want to respond to some of those um, uh, critiques and, and, you know, if you, if you can uh, offer us any, um, any thoughts on how to avoid the, uh, the sort of uh, unintended uh, consequences that, that uh, have been described. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to kick us off, and I'm um, um, and delighted to also hear from um, from our colleagues in the administration uh, from Crystal. Uh, and for what it's worth, I I spent the the whole sort of first fifteen or twenty years of my career before coming to Washington at you know with NGOs, with community groups, um, as a community organizer, and also in local government as that sort of local federal partner on Army Corps of Engineers projects and on. Uh, FEMA uh, projects and, and NFIP mapping and such. Uh, so I'm, uh, I understand um, uh, as much as, as I can uh, with my lived experience, um, everything that, that we're hearing and, uh, and take it on board. Um, I can also share that it's an, an, a very high priority for the select committee, uh, Chair Castor, for our members um, who represent uh, uh, you know, different regions of the United States um, that are contending with, uh, with a variety of threats and hazards, but, but feel very deeply in their bones every single day. Uh, the, the need for real transformation of the, the kinds of governance dynamics and um, and you know, I'm coming from the perspective of Congress, so federal program design and the ways that federal metrics and methodologies are either uh, you know, serving needs or not. Um, and, uh, and so from Congress's perspective, we are uh, really applauding the, the progress that we do see in the extraordinary leadership and really unprecedented leadership of, of this administration. And, um, and I think some very good progress was also made um, in, uh, in the uh, Obama administration when I was um, in, in that White House. Uh, a lot of ground was lost, I think, in between, but I, I, I digress. Um, I, changing the way that federal program managers uh, go about their business in the day-to-day -day is, is challenging. Uh, but I would say who better than the voices that we've been hearing from to help get this right. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to wrap up because there's so much we could hold a whole session on this and maybe we should. Uh, but I think um, uh, this is something that the select committee is also working to respond to uh, in response to the um, a broad range of current events, uh, but also the recent IPCC working group to report on impact and vulnerability and, um, and uh, the need for climate adaptation. The select committee is gonna be holding a hearing on this on the morning of March 9th um, at 9.30 in the morning. It will be hybrid. So we're gonna gather our folks face-to-face, -face, but we will also be broadcasting this in our live stream. Um, and we'll be hearing from experts uh, on these issues. Um, and what I think we're gonna tee up is the notion that we don't have a national climate adaptation plan or strategy um, that reflects the needs of the grassroots, that reflects the needs of vulnerable populations, but also integrates the wisdom um, of, uh, of local communities and um, and folks that have these lived experiences and in indigenous groups. Um, and so uh, there's a lot more to say about that, but, um, but I, I hope that we can use that hearing on the morning of March 9th um, to launch an important dialogue in the Congress that is overdue and quite honestly could be extraordinarily well informed by the people gathered here this afternoon. Um, thanks. Thank you, Sam. 
just a note, I've just heard that uh, unexpectedly uh, Crystal had to leave to, uh, I think, deal with something. Uh, she was called away to, to Washington. Uh, and so I hope you don't mind uh, being, uh, being a proxy, you know, representing the, the federal government. But, you know, just uh, in, in, in thinking about how this is all rolling out, I mean, you can see the, the great uh, expectations that, are, that, are, that people have from the ground about, you know, a transformational, generational, investment uh, in communities that have been underinvested in for, for, for decades, you know, for, for generations. Um, and wanting to make sure that, that we don't lose this opportunity um, and it's done right and doesn't actually exacerbate you know, existing uh, contradictions on the ground. So um, with that in mind, um, you know, creating access to these funds uh, is, a, is, a, is a serious concern. Like, do you have any sense of how the the, the funding will actually roll out. Is, is, it, is it that municipalities will have to, actually there's a question from, uh, I believe it was uh, Charles Clark in the, in the earlier panel about asking about how nonprofits uh, can partner with municipalities or regional organizations to access these funds. There's, there's guidelines that are difficult to understand. Uh, yeah, and so, uh, you know, to that note, to that point, is there, uh, do you have any thoughts on how to uh, maximize access to these funds and um, you know, so we don't end up forcing environmental justice constituencies to compete with each other or attention from, you know, municipalities uh, with, with very limited resources and, and, and need, you know, this sort of transformational comprehensive approach. Alex, is that toward me? If you don't mind, uh, or we can open it up to others as well. I, yeah, I can, I can just quickly share what is going to feel like a really unsatisfying answer. Every, every program has its own uh, design and its own um, procedures and uh, the, the kinds of projects that would be eligible, the kinds of applicants that would be eligible. Um, but having said that, I do think that there are, and, and it was mentioned earlier, I think Kaja mentioned this, the, the notion of regional approaches, I would add to that cross-sectoral approaches. We had a question in the chat earlier you know, how can more uh, you know, private sector partners participate? But I would also add that, that what are the ways that, that federal programs can be better navigated uh, where there's more direct access to funding, um, but also approaches that can be uniquely tailored to the partnerships that are forming up organically, uh, being able to go after these funds and compete for these funds. Um, every program, whether we're talking FEMA or Army Corps, EPA, DOT, et cetera, HUD, um, you know, has their, their own program design. And so this is where I do think that there's a good faith effort coming through Mitch Landrew's team, uh, through OMB, through the folks at CEQ, to try to put forward as much information in that guidebook as they can about the bipartisan infrastructure law programs. Um, to make that as navigable as possible. But here in Congress, what we're also thinking where, where federal program design is first sort of set in law is, you know, how can we direct the agencies and the administration uh, to, um, to implement these programs in ways that make it more accessible. We're seeing a whole lot of funding getting gummed up at the state level. Uh, we're seeing uh, a real risk in the implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law of, of big new money being spent in old ways. Um, and, and we have to, to find ways in our oversight role as we look at this implementation um, to make sure that the money is moving quickly and efficiently, but also that it's taking into account um, the, uh, the, the priorities that are being identified through the grassroots and on the ground. Um, again, I, I, I'm hoping that we will have this conversation with my select committee members on the morning of March 9th. I do think that what we're gonna hear from our witnesses is uh, that, that there is a need for um, fundamental change in how federal programs are, de are designed and accessed and that these barriers are, are overcome. Uh, that's definitely on our minds. And so again, I know that feels like a really, really unsatisfying answer, except to you know, hopefully say that that it that we are hearing you. 
There are ways though, even under the existing programs where, for example, um, nonprofit organizations, community housing organizations, public health organizations, um, and you know, certainly indigenous uh, groups and um, social justice organizations, environmental ju justice organizations um, can be engaging with local communities in the design and formulations of these applications. But what I think we're all looking for is for that to be embedded in the procedure, embedded in the process. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, I think, where we're, we're trying to get. Uh, but uh, I think some programs get at that more meaningfully than others. Yeah, um, thanks thanks for that, Sam. Uh, it's really too bad that Crystal's not here to sort of hear that and, and you know, be able to respond. We'll follow up with her. But uh, I'm wondering if Elizabeth or Justin, you want to add any more on that question of access uh, to these funds and, and actual procedures for how communities uh, get to them. Uh, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to respond. So I, I was the chair of the NEJAC under the Obama administration, and um, it was really frustrating to see how slow everything moves when it comes to allocating resources in our community and how there is a willingness to compromise justice. And so the rhetoric really becomes, these are the things that we're trying to do and we're struggling and it's gonna take time, but the time that it takes costs our, us lives, right? There's that. But you move quickly uh, in developing relationships with the private sector. We don't even know how those relationships and that criteria is vetted. And funding, billions of dollars are being invested in false solutions. And that move, money is moving really, really quickly. Um, and there are people in the administration uh, that are literally the SARS of false solutions, of, 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 of cap and trade, of literally um, uh, a policy that harms our communities. And, and so there is this willingness to talk about what well, we're doing all of these great things and pretend that the issue was not raised about false solutions and about the fact that there are different sectors that are treated differently. Um, there's also this trend that I'm seeing where government is working closely with the private sector and philanthropy. And those three sectors are coming together to determine what frontline priorities are and where investments have to happen. But the truth is that organizations like the Climate Justice Alliance, we've done the landscaping and we've done the landscaping in Indian country, we've done it in coastal communities and island territories, we've done it in urban areas and we know where the needs are because the people in the communities have told us where those needs are. Everything from having the tools to do the air monitoring themselves and not bringing in tech to do that for us, to even talking to the National Institutes of, and Health, and health uh, so that the science and the tools are put in the hands of people. These are old conversations uh, and the, the response is also really dated and climate change is really moving quickly. So there has to be a boldness and a commitment to thinking about governance differently and being really uh, self-critical and doing that internal audit that I suggested uh, so that we can move as quickly as we can uh, to share resources and information. We're not adverse to getting technical assistance or to working with other people. It's how people come into community and whether it serves the needs that we have articulated. And there are too many inconsistencies right now. Um, and it is unfortunate because literally time is up. So I just, I just wanna say that because uh, you know, in New York City, one of the reasons I mentioned offshore winds and I mentioned all of the things we're doing is because we are working with the mayor's office and we are working with NYSERDA and the New York City Economic Development Corporation and, and, and universities. We're doing all those things, but they're not making the decisions for us and they're not determining what the priorities are for us. We're talking about co-governance. We're talking about a different way of working with each other where they're not just listening to us and we become sort of the passive recipients of somebody's good intentions. We are driving transformation. We're doing it in New York City and we're doing it in the state of New York. And so that's what we expect. We expect that to be happening all over the country. You know, there are 
you know, someone talked about what's happening around uh, indigenous lands in, the, in, in, in this country and their solutions. People are putting down solar. They're talking about stormwater. They're talking about food sovereignty. And that's the other thing that people focus on renewable energy without thinking about what a just transition is and that that is a bucket that carries a lot of things that are going to be able to help our people thrive in the midst of climate change. So um, anyway, I just, I just wanted to put that out there because I get really really concerned when, uh, when I hear, well, you know, we're moving slow and we got to do this because that's the conversation that has put our people in harm's way for generations. The, the, the need is immediate, no question. Um, yeah. Um, you know, on that, on that question of technical assistance you raised, Elizabeth, um, I know that Uprose is part of this Justice 40 Accelerator. Could you just speak to that a little bit? And, and you know, is there you know, yeah. and what what's what scale of, uh, of of this kind of assistance is needed to allow to to enable and empower communities to access the funding? Yeah, so that is a, an, a great initiative because what it does is it makes it possible to level level the playing field. Different organizations are in different places in terms of their capacity to access the resources, and some of the processes that are in place to access resources were created uh, to make it possible for multi-million dollar organizations that have departments that can access and process this federal funding to do it. So behind uh, the accelerator is this, uh, this intention to make it possible for frontline organizations to be able to access the resources documented, use it to operationalize a just transition. And I think it's a model uh, that the federal government can benefit from. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Justin, do you anything else you wanted to add on, on the questions that have been raised here? I think Elizabeth's points were really spot on. Um, the one thing that, that really stands out to me is just how opaque uh, I think a lot of the community participation has been with the development of the screening tool and, and Justice 40 in general, um, especially when looking at other states initiatives and how well documented that is. And I think the really extensive time that's been invested in developing these authentic relationships. Um, and then to see, for instance, um, the CGES tool, you know, it gets released and there's, there's not any information that I can find on how community was involved or um, engaged in, in developing that or the methodology. And so I, I just think there's a real gap. Um, Kyle identified this, you know, as a lack of resources uh, in CEQ and, um, and the WEJAC to, to do this work. So um, I guess that's, that's one other thing that I would bring to this. Okay. Um... Uh, there was a question identified from the chat about the possibility of extending uh, funding past 2026 because of due to, to labor shortages. I wonder if um, you know maybe Sam or uh, any of you all would like to answer that one. Yeah, I I think it's still um, a little bit early, although uh, this is not the first time I've been asked this question and. Um, I do think as we look at the trends on implementation, each program um, or sort of appropriations line item is, is gonna need to be evaluated to see uh, where uh, those extensions are, are gonna be warranted and, um, and, uh, and look at doing those, those quickly. I think part of the challenge though, is that if we are looking at some change in, um, uh, in uh, the the majority here in in the Congress, it's it's going to be uh, challenging, I think, on on some of those fronts to try to uh, to get those extended. But um, but this is where I do think that a you know an evidence based approach is going to be really important to be able to point to specific barriers in implementation um, or issues that are that are leading to these delays that would that would make extensions of these programs warranted. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Carolyn and uh, Nasser have been uh, monitoring the chat, and I wonder if there's anything that stands out. I think we have time for one more question. Or if there's nothing, then um, I feel like you've done a great job of covering a lot of the major major questions. <laughs> okay, okay. There's one more thing I wanted to you know to to raise, which is uh, Justice 40 covers 40 percent of these 
you know, large scale investments. And then there's the other 60%. So we've been talking about the 40%, uh, you know, uh, as a way of, to remediate, you know, some of the, some of the disinvestment and, and uh, you know, EJ questions and so on. To, to what extent are, are folks keeping an eye on that other 60% and, and you know, how worried are folks that that is gonna be working counter to the interests of environmental justice communities? Um, yeah, any, any thoughts about that other 60% and uh, how to avoid you know, worsening problems on the ground? Uh, from the perspective of Congress, we're looking at every single dollar. That's part of our role in oversight and making sure that all of these investments are not driving maladaptation on the ground, are not driving unsustainable uh, uh, outcomes on the ground or um, exacerbating risk or, or harm uh, or um, you know, negative impacts on the ground. Um, and so, uh, you know, from, from our view, we're, we're looking at all of it. And for the select committee, we, uh, we really work with our counterparts on all of the authorizing committees of the Congress. So, um, so we're, we're looking at all of it. Um, and, and that's certainly our objective. We, we don't, we're, we're not constrained by any one particular agency or, or program or mission. Um, and the Justice 40 initiative is, is, is an initiative of the president that, that really goes toward implementation under those executive authorities. Uh, we're you know, working, um, I think, in, in, in great coordination with the administration on Justice 40 and making sure that the way that we are uh, you know, designing legislation um, lifts that up. Uh, but, but we're looking at every single dollar and, and making sure that it's going to achieve what the Congress set out for it to achieve. Okay. Thank you, Sam. It's clearly, there's a, a, a need for uh, this conversation to be continued, and there's, there's a lot of um, uh, discussion yet to be had. Um, Nasser, I'm going to turn it over to you for, uh, I don't know if you, there's more, a, a question you wanted to raise from the, from the chat, or if you want to just close this out. Um, <clears throat> I think there are uh, a lot of the great questions that were listed you covered, so um, I think we'll just move on to the closing. So thank you. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you to our attendees for the great questions and engagement, and also, um, of course, to all of our speakers for their insightful presentations and, and answers. I know there's still a lot of uh, questions on the mechanics of um, getting kind of the, the state money down to local communities. So uh, we're already talking about doing a follow-up program to see if we can set up a longer Q&A. Um, our next Climate Adaptation Forum, uh, save the date, it's gonna be on June 3rd. And this will be our first in-person forum since March of 2020. So we'll finally get to see each other's faces again. Um, the focus is on extreme heat and drought, uh, which is a, of course an important topic to um, any communities in the region and beyond. And we look forward to your uh, participation. So keep an eye out um, for uh, registration for that future climate adaptation forum. And thanks again to everybody. Thanks everyone. Um, there was a forum feedback link in the chat. If you are so inclined to provide feedback, I'll put it into the, the chat once again here. Um, I'm seeing a lot of great comments coming in, so it might, it might get lost in the waterfall of comments, but it, it'll also be sent to everyone shortly. So really appreciate your time today and bearing with us through some tech issues, uh, some login issues. Great job by Alex, Carolyn, and Nasser for pulling this together, and of course, Kelly Nee as well. And uh, thanks to all of our speakers, really great job. Um, a lot of great information, and uh, we hope that you can find some time to meet us in Boston in June. So take care, everyone. Have a great weekend.